Hi, I'm Lewis Friedberg. Today we're going to be talking about the situation with uh, the media in South Africa and some of the latest developments in, uh, in South Africa, where of course the black resistance is picking up, at, up steam at an enormous pace and the South African government is attempting to place a cocoon, an informational cocoon around that country. They've succeeded to a certain extent and have failed in many other respects. Uh, what we'll be doing in the next uh, half hour or so is uh, looking first, uh, first of all, at the internal situation. What is happening internally with the, with the media in South Africa? And then in the latter part of the program, we will deal with some of the latest press restrictions that have been imposed in South Africa. Before we get started, I should tell you a little bit about myself. I am uh, currently a, um, an editor at Pacific News Service in San Francisco. I was born and raised in South Africa, in Cape Town, at the southern tip of uh, South Africa. And uh, in the last four or five years, I've been returned to South Africa about four or five times. And uh, most recently, just two months ago. I was in South Africa nine months ago when the state of emergency was first imposed, the first state of emergency, and I was there last February when it was lifted. Since uh, I was in South Africa last, the situation has deteriorated substantially. And um, of course, it's virtually impossible now for journalists to get into South Africa. The, uh, the couple of hundred accredited journalists in South Africa are having a tough time keeping their credentials. Many of them are um, there at the, basically at the whim of the government and uh, can have their, their uh, journalist credentials revoked at any, at any point. This has made getting into South Africa and bringing the word out of South Africa even more difficult. Before we get into that, let me just give you a brief uh, rundown on the various uh, aspects of the media in South Africa. When I was growing up in South Africa, there was no television. Television was first introduced in 1976, uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. And for years uh, before that, the uh, nationalist uh, government was very afraid of television for a number of reasons. First of all, they thought that it would corrupt the morals of, of, uh, of white South Africans. Second of all, they were concerned that they would be very dependent on um, programs from overseas, particularly American programs, that they wouldn't have any control over, and that in fact would deal with race issues, would perhaps deal with blacks and whites together on the same screen. Uh, they were concerned about that. They were also concerned um, that there was an issue of how they were going to get programming, television programming, to whites and different television programming to blacks. So there were some technical problems that had to be overcome. However, the pressures within South Africa by the mid-1970s were so strong that in 1976 the South Africans introduced television for the first time. Now initially, the uh, television was pretty much directed towards whites. And you still have, just like you have apartheid in virtually every aspect of South African life, you also have uh, apartheid in media programming. That uh, what you have is a, a channel that's directed towards whites. That's channel one. The so-called coloreds and Indians who tend to live near white areas um, are allowed to also watch the white channel. They've now introduced two other channels, channels two and three, which uh, are directed towards black South Africans. And those channels are in black South African languages, in about the half dozen or so indigenous black South African languages. Most whites don't understand uh, the indigenous languages in South Africa. And for that reason, they don't watch channels two and three. Many blacks who can understand, who have to understand English, have to be able to speak English and Afrikaans, which is the other official language in South Africa. They are able to watch channel, the, the, the channel that's supposed to be directed towards whites. The government throughout the country has carefully placed the transmitters for the different channels so as to pretty much try to restrict the, the, the programming that will be a, a, available to, to blacks and whites. 
Now, ironically, in spite of their fears, uh, or perhaps it's kind of become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, in light of their fears that they would be dependent on overseas programming. That is, in fact, what has happened in South Africa. Virtually all the, most, all the programming on South African television is American. Uh, the number one rated show, the top rated show in South Africa now, is, of all things, the Cosby Show. Um, <laughs> the number two rated show, which is, which, uh, the Cosby Show just bumped this program, program out of the top spot, is Dallas. You get all these other programs like Mr. T, uh, the A-Team, that's a big uh, program down there. Miami Vice has just, um, has just started airing in South Africa. Uh, Knots Landing, Falcon Crest, Dynasty, as they say in South Africa. Uh, and uh, it's quite an extraordinary thing because what we have in South Africa are all these programs which portray blacks in a positive light, which are watched totally by everybody in the, uh, throughout South Africa, those who have television. When um, the Cosby Show is on on Saturday nights in South Africa, if you go to a party, oftentimes the party will come to a dead halt while the guests and the hosts watch um, the Cosby Show. When you ask uh, white South Africans how they feel about blacks on television being portrayed in a very positive way, they say, well, of course, our blacks aren't like that, or your blacks are different. So uh, there's a kind of a double standard there which, uh, which uh, white South Africans have trouble dealing with. Um, however, what is particularly sinister about South African television, and which is what is sinister about the television, the American television programming which is being shown on South African TV, is that the programs like Dallas, like Dynasty, like uh, Miami Vice make television palatable as a propaganda tool. And that is essentially what television has become in South Africa. A propaganda tool, a propaganda machine for the South African government. They, the government controls very, very, very carefully the kind of information that white South Africans get to see. For example, they show very, very little of the, uh, of the black resistance, at least the responsible aspects of the black resistance. They uh, will show the most gruesome aspects of the conflicts that have occurred in South Africa. Um, this necklacing uh, issue where many South African blacks in the conflicts that have evolved in the townships uh, who have been labeled as collaborationists with the regime have been burnt to death. The government loves to show people being burnt to death, being necklaced to death. Most of the time, all you see on, on um, television are government ministers putting forward the government line. The news is not news in the sense that we know it. It's a government announcer. It's called a news reader. The news reader gets up every night and says, this is so-and-so reading the news, and it's the news packaged by the government. <laughs> Alongside television, you have the, the print media. And if you go to South Africa, what you will see, there will be a semblance, there will be a semblance of an independent press. There are 21 daily newspapers in South Africa. About half of them are uh, Afrikaans speaking, are in, in the Afrikaans language and the other half are in English. The English press has had a long tradition of liberalism in South Africa. However, what they have had to do is deal with incredible press restrictions. Uh, there's a 322-page there's a <coughs> manual called uh, the Every Man's Guide to the Newspaper Law in South Africa, 322 pages, which is kind of the Bible of every journalist. What's interesting about South Africa is that there haven't really been government censors. It's been up to the, the, the newspaper editors themselves to censor themselves. You never really know when you are transgressing the, uh, the law in South Africa. And uh, the, the, what's happening of late is that some of the English language press 
is trying now to press what they term gray areas. Those areas of the, of the law which are not clearly defined. A few months ago, the Cape Times, which is one of the most liberal papers in South Africa, um, published an interview with Oliver Tambo of the African National Congress. It was the first time in 22 years that uh, uh, an interview with the African National Congress was published in South Africa. The editor, Tony Hurd, was, uh, is, uh, is un was arrested. He's now out on bail, facing a three-year jail sentence. This is the kind, of, the kind of pressures, the kind of intimidation that, um, that newspaper editors in South Africa face. We'll be back in a couple of minutes to talk about the current situation and some of the increased controls that have been imposed by the government on the press in South Africa. of South Africa is white. Nineteen of the 21 daily newspapers and all four major weekly newspapers are owned by four companies. There are no black-owned mass circulation newspapers or magazines. There is one white journalist for every 1,200 whites and one black journalist for every 52,000 blacks. South African newspapers operate under more than 100 censorship laws prohibiting speculation on the circumstances of detainees' death, publishing information on prison conditions or experiences, printing anything about banned meetings, quoting any banned person. black daily newspaper, 13.8% of blacks read a white daily. All radio and TV in South Africa is controlled by the government. The state of emergency prohibits publication of subversive statements. This t-shirt here is, um, was put out by the End Conscription Campaign, which is a uh, significant movement that's now spreading throughout South Africa where people are organizing against the draft in South Africa. And uh, this t-shirt says troops out, and it's on a backdrop of uh, press clippings. This t-shirt was banned in South Africa, as have many, many other t-shirts in South Africa. This is an example of where things are now in South Africa. The government has clamped down on virtually every form of dissent. It has become virtually impossible for uh, the press to publish in any meaningful way. Just a few weeks ago, the, uh, the government imposed incredibly stringent, the most stringent press censorship in South Africa. For many years, the government, I think, had a, and it was ambivalent about the press, that it had, was trying to create the illusion, the facade of a democracy in South Africa. And so they kind of tolerated the press 
at the same time imposing all kinds of restrictions. They've now abandoned that facade, even though we still get people like the Foreign Minister Pick Buerta getting up on Nightline and saying to Ted Koppel that there's complete press freedom in South Africa. This, I suppose, is what the Foreign Minister was referring to, complete press freedom in South Africa. This is the Weekly Mail, which is a very courageous newspaper that uh, has been publishing what has been going on in South Africa in a more consistent way, in a more focused way than just about any other newspaper in South Africa. And uh, the week the state of emergency was declared, the government came in and confiscated the entire run of the newspaper of that particular week. The following week, not daunted, the, uh, the editors put out this newspaper with the headline saying, our lawyers tell us we can say almost nothing critical about the emergency, but we'll try. And then what they did was they went through and crossed out everything that they were not allowed to publish. And the consequence was this. This is a list of all the detainees in South Africa. It is not, it's illegal to publish names of detainees in South Africa. So what they did was there was a list that was accumulated by a, a very impressive organization, the Detainees Parents Support Committee, and they listed everybody's names, but then crossed it out with this black tape. And this is how it's going in South Africa right now. Continued, continued uh, difficulties in covering uh, what's going on there. Now, another thing that's happened is that foreign reporters are getting thrown out with uh, increasing regularity. Um, this is the article, the last article published by the Newsweek reporter who was asked to leave just um, a few weeks ago. Farewell, South Africa, his last dispatch from South Africa. Ironically, he ran into Nelson, uh, Winnie Mandela at the airport as he was leaving. Winnie Mandela says, well, we'll, we'll welcome you back to South Africa after the revolution, which hopefully will not be too far away. Another tragic thing that's happened in the last few weeks is that the first journalist has been killed in South Africa. Uh, George Dioth, a, uh, a CBS camera person, was um, caught in the crossfire at Crossroads, the squatter camp outside of uh, South Africa, outside of Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, was brutally hacked to death. So it's become very, very difficult for journalists to do any kind of meaningful reporting. So Alaka Susulu, one of the leading black journalists in South Africa, who was editor of a new newspaper in South Africa called The New Nation, which was published by the uh, Catholics' Bishops' Conference, was um, arrested a few weeks ago. Actually, he was at his house, middle of the night. These hooded men broke down the gates to his house. He had set up a security arrangement there. They broke down the gates, broke down his door, and took him off in the middle of the night. And it was only days later that his family found out that it was the police that had actually taken him off. And Zwilaka Susulu is uh, in detention right now. As are other black reporters, uh, Srini Moodley, who's a reporter with the Natal Witness, he is in jail. And appeals from editors throughout the world seem to fall on deaf ears. Now, one of the things that has happened, though, is that ironically, the government's attempt, the government's goal was to deflect attention away from South Africa with this press censorship. But what it's done is actually attract attention. It has focused attention on South Africa in a more direct way than anything that they have done in, uh, in years. Because for the first time, foreign journalists now are experiencing the kinds of bureaucratic nightmares in covering the news that U.S. that South African reporters have had to deal with for many, many, many years. And this is something that has gotten the American media editors in this country extremely riled up, and they are now going out of their way to cover South Africa in a way that uh, perhaps they wouldn't have done otherwise. 
And um, in the week following the imposition of these, of these uh, press restrictions, the New York Times, for the entire week after those restrictions were imposed, carried stories on the front page from South Africa. Um, and it is, continues to do very uh, consistent reporting. Uh, it's a little disturbing in the last few days. It appears that uh, the coverage is now drying up a little. But um, in spite of the restrictions, we still are getting a good deal of news from South Africa. And the, then the, the imposition of censorship, I think, has also heightened calls for international sanctions. So that the, the, the goals of the, of the government in imposing censorship, imposing this extremely severe censorship, have really uh, backfired, at least as far as focusing attention on South Africa. What we don't know, what is very disturbing, is what is going on in the rural areas outside of uh, the immediate orbit of activists, people in the main urban areas like Johannesburg, Cape Town, and, uh, and Durban. And it will be a long time before we actually find out uh, what, is, what is going on. One of the things uh, that the government has done is also arrested many black reporters who for many uh, years have been one of the main sources of news because they live in the township. How do you, how do you censor people who are actually witness to the news? And um, what they've done is essentially picked up many of the black reporters who have always uh, been, been uh, the target of most of the government's uh, uh, attempts to silence the press and, of course, blacks. As a black journalist, there's a, you have a double strike against you. Number one, you're black, and number two, you're a journalist. So the question at this point is, is how long is the government going to continue to impose these restrictions? Is there any chance that they will lift any of these restrictions, release any of these reporters? And uh, at this moment, uh, there's not much room for optimism in that, uh, in that arena. Now, the question is, where are South Africans now getting their news internally? And again, in one of those ironies, in one of those ironies of the South African situation, uh, whites find themselves completely shut off from information. That whites are now having to rely on blacks for their source of news. That uh, one of the main uh, points of contact in South Africa between whites and blacks is uh, in, in both the, in the workplace with black workers and also in the home where you have domestic black domestic workers. And so you find that a lot of whites are now relying on blacks in a very unusual way to get the news about what's going on in the townships. South African blacks are the most informed of, of uh, all South Africans at this point. There's a, there's a kind of bush telegraph system that works in the township. If something happens in one township, the news travels incredibly quickly throughout South Africa, throughout the black townships of South Africa, that even though the press can't quote people, ban people, uh, people who are on restricted lists, that that news tends to travel very quickly amongst blacks. And of course, blacks are experiencing the news. They are the news. And so that what we have is, is uh, actually a quite informed populace where, when it comes to, to at least black, the black population. Whites continue to live in their own little informational cocoon. They can't hear from the African National Congress. They, uh, they see people like Bishop Tutu, who in this country is seen as a moderate leader. They see him as an extreme radical. And uh, if you have any conversations with white South Africans and you mention Bishop Tutu, they just get extremely upset and get, are extremely upset that he's been advocating sanctions in this country. So that there's still a view uh, amongst whites, and it's a view that has been very carefully nurtured and carefully controlled by the government, the view that really the police are justified in what they're doing in the townships, 
that a lot of the unrest in the townships is inspired by communists, controlled by Moscow, and that the ANC is really a puppet of the South African Communist Party. And uh, also that the grievances that are being articulated by blacks really have no foundation. And it is that view that the government wants to maintain in its own population and is going to continue to do by extending this informational cocoon that now envelops South Africa. So what we need to do at this point is to figure out ways to get the news out of South Africa. People are calling down to South Africa, getting some of the news out. And uh, one hopes that uh, the media in this country will uh, continue to do what they can until they get kicked out of the country, which could be any time.